So, as promised, here we go now with some examples taken from humanistic manuscripts and critical editions of humanist works. I'd like to begin with a few comments on structure and how a scribe's culture can influence the transmission of a given text. I hope the examples I'm about to show will clarify some basic principles. The first of which principles can be summed up as follows. Structure matters. This may sound similar to, if not identical with, the notion that size matters, since structure has to do with that too. Yet, it is not limited to the mere length of a text. What I'm about to discuss has to do more precisely with the various parts that make up a text. Likewise, it has to do with how those various sections within a text can be perceived as, to a certain extent, independent or self-sufficient by the scribes and, consequently, isolated, decontextualized and broken into distinct units. A second important notion that I'll try to clarify by means of examples from humanistic writings and the manuscripts preserving them is that scribes did not copy those texts for posterity. Unpleasant as it may sound, we must accept that those scribes did not set pen to paper in order to do us a favor. Their interest was not preserving writings for generations to come, so that one day philologists, you and I, could come up with precise critical editions. Scribes usually copied text for two main reasons. One was their profession. That is, some were professional scribes. As such, they were commissioned by their patrons to transcribe those copies. The quality of a given manuscript and several basic features reveal almost immediately if this is the case or not. I'm speaking of the quality of parchment, the kind of script, the handwrite basically, the presence of rich illuminations and decorative patterns, above all on the first page of the manuscripts, where the patron's coat of arms is sometimes illuminated, colorful rubrics for the work titles, usually in red, hence the name from Latin ruber for red, a precious binding, if original, a neat series of clearly and evenly cut fascicules, and so on. Furthermore, the same characteristics may reveal if the manuscript in question was composed by an independent scribe or one who worked for some famous book-selling company that served the libraries of dukes, popes, rich collectors, and so on. A case in point is the company that Vespasiano da Bisticci ran in Florence in the mid-15th century, serving such customers as several pontiffs, the Medici family, and Duke Frederick of Urbino. Monasteries too, as is well known, were important centers for the production of manuscripts. This phenomenon is not limited to the Middle Ages, rather it extends well into the Renaissance too. In the last section of this video I will show a manuscript, now in Oxford, preserving a work by Coluccio Salutati, from which I'll draw a few examples on punctuation, scribal errors and marginalia, that is, notes in the margins of a manuscript. The decoration reveals that this manuscript was produced, like others that Salutati owned, in the monastery of Santa Maria degli Angeli in Florence, at the very beginning of the 15th century. Another possibility is that scribes wrote a text for their own personal use. These are the most difficult manuscripts to read, but they often prove the most interesting. They can be very helpful to reconstruct the text if the scribe responsible for that copy was a promising young scholar or a humanist who had already become famous. Moreover, though hardly ever elegant and in most cases quite messy and difficult to read, manuscripts written for personal use can prove very important to explain the format in which some witnesses preserve a given text. This is specifically the topic I would like to tackle now for a few minutes. Like all the cases listed so far, these two calls on philology, paleography and codicology at once. As anticipated, these three sister arts must go hand in hand. As we shall soon see, this is particularly true when probing hypotheses on the origins of a text which are based on the different format in which they have come down to us. Let me try to make this point by giving a famous example. Leonardo Bruni's dialogues and the so-called Baron thesis on this important work. Born in Berlin in 1900 and migrated to the US right before World War II, Hans Behren was an illustrious scholar of Renaissance history whose influence on the field of studies, especially from the 1950s to the turn of the last century, can hardly be overstated. Still today, he is remembered above all for his interpretation of the Italian Renaissance based on the idea of civic humanism, as he called it. According to Behren, a major feature of Florentine humanist literature in the late 14th and early 15th centuries was its emphasis on the political role that men of letters were expected to play in their city-states. 
Such role entailed the promotion of the city's image and ideology through their writings, especially by celebrating local history and famous citizens. Baron held that a telling example of the shift from a detached to an engaged assessment of Florentine culture, that is a conversion to civic humanism, is to be found in Leonardo Bruni's Dialogy. The full title of this early Latin work by Bruni reads Dialogy at Petrum Paulum Historum. For fellow humanist and friend, Pier Paolo Vergerio, the dedicatee, was originally from Istria, a peninsula in modern-day Slovenia close to the Italian border. Together with Poggio Bracciolini, Roberto de Rossi, and other famous humanists, both Bruni and Vergerio had been pupils of Coluccio Salutati, the famous chancellor of Florence, who proved instrumental in the revival of classical antiquity at the end of the 14th century. It was thanks to Salutati, for instance, that in 1397 the famous Byzantine scholar Manuel Chrysoloras came to Florence to teach Greek language and literature in the local university for three consecutive years. A distinguishing feature of Bruni's dialogues is what experts on rhetoric would call a palinode. A palinode is the formal retractation of something we have said or written. Basically, a palinode is a recantation by which a person expresses the very opposite opinion that he or she had given on a certain topic. This is exactly what happens in Bruni's two dialogues, reporting a conversation between Florian humanists held in two consecutive days. In day one, Niccolo Niccoli, a humanist notorious for his polemical attitude, criticizes the so-called Three Crowns of Florence, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, for their scarce knowledge of the ancient Greek and Roman classics. In Niccoli's opinion, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio did not break away as much as they should have from what he considers a medieval, scholastic, and therefore despicable approach to literary studies. In day two, instead, when the same scholars meet again to resume their conversation, Niccoli reverses this opinion, praising Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio as shining glories of Florence. As he explains, what he said the day before was just a joke, or a ruse, if you will, meant to irritate Coluccio Salutati, to whom he pays homage as the mentor of a whole new generation of humanists, starting with those who participated in this two-day gathering. Such, in a nutshell, is the plot of Bruni's dialogues. Back to Baron now. The fact that some manuscripts report the first dialogue alone led him to believe that Bruni had composed this early work of his in two different stages. First, Baron claimed, Bruni composed Dialogue 1, containing Nicholas' provocative statements about Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio around 1401, when it still held that the three crowns of Florence were to be deemed in low esteem because of the aristocratic, snobbish behavior that marked the initial steps of his literary career. Only several years later, presumably soon after the death of his teacher Coluccio Salutati in May 1406, he had a dialogue too. In doing so, Baron explains, Bruni showed his shift to what the German scholar called civic humanism, that is, as anticipated, a stance bent on celebrating Florentine glories so as to support the city, its ideology, history, and propaganda, whether cultural or, more broadly speaking, political. For some 40 years, eminent scholars of the Italian Renaissance have spilled much ink on this theory put forth by Baron. No matter how suggestive or convincing their often opposite readings seemed, the only way to probe the validity of Baron's opinion was to carry out a complete recensio, that is, a scrutiny and comparison, of all extant copies, about 50, of Bruni's dialogues and see if any discrepancies separated the manuscript preserving only the first dialogue from those with both.